All right, so today I want to talk about inflation. There's a lot of talk about inflation out there that I think is just completely and utterly wrong. Uh, I think that these folks are really mistaking the trees for the forests, hills for mountains, and just bear me out as I talk you through my view of what is going on currently and why I really disbelieve in this idea that what we're currently experiencing, even though uh, there is actual pain if you go to the supermarket or any place else where prices are rising, this is not actually inflation in the way at least that I understand it. All right, so from the way I look at it, what's going right now is you're seeing a series of price increases associated with really just about everything. It doesn't matter. You could be going to the grocery store and you know the cost of uh, eggs might be you know 10% higher, 15% higher. That's true. You know, I saw even an article recently talking about how the price of firewood is going up. Um, and there's a number of reasons provided for it. People say, oh, you know, people can't afford to heat up their houses using um, a natural gas and they're swapping out with, with firewood. I actually don't think that most people actually set up to do this. So I, I doubt this is an explanation, even though it sounds pretty good in an article that this is what's going on. Now, from my judgment, when I look at it, you know, from a sort of a macro perspective, top down, generally speaking, I look at most things from like a bottom up. But this perspective uh, is based on lots of pieces of information, but provides a sort of macro understanding of inflation, which is that uh, the old way of doing things was based on something called just in time inventory. In other words, everything was just shipped just in time for you to make the thing. So if you were a car company, well, you know, you would never keep any inventory of, you know, extra parts to make cars. Instead, they would just constantly be shipped, whether it be from Europe or Asia or any place else, just on a regular basis. So in other words, no one had any excess stock. And this was done in the name of financial efficiency and has been going on for really like something like 30, 40 years. It started in the late, it started in the 80s, uh, uh, as uh, American companies tried to copy uh, what the Japanese were doing. And they were really uh, the ones that you know, innovated on this idea of just-in-time inventory. However, we found out in 2020 that just-in-time inventory does not take into an account a, a pandemic that can really completely disrupt the idea of being able to make things and then send them in very short periods of time. So as the world shut itself down for over a year and then slowly reopen, what happened is that you started to see shortages happen at sort of at the base level where they're making the initial parts. And that, that started to transmit itself uh, all across to what now is being referred to as the supply chain crisis. And you are seeing just this roll through again, again. And then it's also affecting the transportation system. Now, if you just sort of like go out, let's say one year or two years or three years, just think about what people's response to all of this is. Uh, what are people doing in their houses? Well, they're stocking up on a lot of different things because people are anticipating that prices are going to rise. Uh, and what's going on at the companies or at the stores? Well, they're also stocking up uh, because they're like, well, you know, we can't have enough. We don't want to have a stock out situation where we lose a customer. So at every uh, level, people are starting to increase their inventories. And quite predictably, you can imagine what's going to happen two or three years, which is that everybody's going to have too much stock. Simultaneously, at the same time, uh, countries like the United States uh, and companies that operate in are saying, hey, the just-in-time inventory model clearly has issues. We want to reshore 10, 20, 30, maybe even all of the production of various parts and bring them back to the U.S., uh, because people want more certainty around their supply chain where they can have it more on hand. Other companies are going into vertical integration where they're taking over the making of the various parts that go into making whatever that they do. So there's a lot of responses that are going on, and those responses are all deeply deflationary. And the reason for that is that when companies go to uh, reshore production in the U.S. or let's say, you know, any place where they're going to do that, what are they doing? Well, what they're doing is they're, they're taking a lot of money and they're spending it on 
innovations like in the Internet of Things, like artificial intelligence, like 3D printing, like so many other uh, new ways of doing things that are exponentially more productive, exponentially more efficient than the old ways of doing things, whether it be, you know, if you're making something through lathes and mills and these kinds of things versus 3D printing. And that's deeply deflationary. No one is going to put up a new plant and, you know, use, you know, technology from 20 or 30 years ago. They're going to use state of the art, modern ways of doing things that are so much more productive, so much more efficient, so much cheaper than the old way. So as this sort of unfolds, what you're starting to see is a more rapid substitution effect as people start to actually invest in new technology that is deflationary. So while the current period of what people are calling inflation um, is painful, uh, especially uh, if you are going to buy those things where the prices have risen a great deal, the response to it uh, by companies is going to be quite deflationary to the point where you could really see a very severe price collapse in the old world companies that make some of these goods uh, whose prices have inflated higher. In other words, uh, as a result of lifting prices, they really have created the competition that is going to destroy those price increases and destroy really the, the market for that. And it'll be substituted by companies that are making things using America 2.0 technologies that really cut costs down, make it much cheaper, make it more efficiently, make it in a much more productive way, which is why bottom line to me, if you go and look at really the best way to determine if there's real inflation, which is bond yields, and I look at the 10-year bond yield, you'll see that while the 10-year bond yield has risen from the crisis low, from the COVID crisis low, it's still about where it was about two or three years ago. And if there was a true belief by people that we were going to see ongoing persistent inflation, you would see that bond yield continue to go up past 3%, maybe 5%, uh, or even higher as people anticipate that interest rates need to go up to really offset this persistent inflation. So that's really the my way of looking at inflation today, which is that Inflation today is really as a result of the lockdowns that every country around the world implemented in 2020 and into some part of 2021, and to some extent still implement from time to time when people are fearful that COVID is going to once again become a major issue in their country. Then it snarled up the supply chain where inventory was run out because nobody made anything for something like a year. Uh, which then transmitted itself at every step of the way. That in turn sort of locked up the transportation markets, particularly shipping, uh, where you couldn't really get things to be shipped in the timeframes that you wanted. Uh, those, the price of shipping has skyrocketed. However, the long and medium term and even actually fairly short term impact is this massive substitution effect of technology that is coming in to actually address this which is deeply deflationary and which also really benefits our companies because we are invested across the board exclusively in these America 2.0 disruptive technologies, disruptive innovations. And that's really where the money is flowing into to really solve this problem. And that's music to the ears of anybody that is subscribed to the companies in our services because it means that Looking out into 2022, 2023 and forward, it means rising sales growth, rising sales, uh, and also more and more demand for the stocks of these companies that either make the technologies or implement them. So I am very, very bullish, very optimistic, very positive on our companies, America 2.0 companies, fourth industrial revolution companies, that in my judgment, in my opinion, represent the solution to these price rises that you know the media is calling inflation. All right, so that's my video for this week. Come back next week, or I'll have another one for you. Until then, this is Paul saying bye.